Donc maintenant, euh, John Glaspie va nous... And now John Glaspie is going to speak about American recommendations, NCCM and AFSCO. Okay. So, <clears throat> thank you for, uh, for inviting me. My assignment was to review the U.S. guidelines from ASH and ASCO to, to professional societies and the NCCN for hematologic toxicities management. And I'll start with the red cells uh, uh, approach. The ASH and ASCO guidelines have traditionally been very slow uh, and very conservative and less helpful. Uh, this is the most recent iteration of the ASH and ASCO ESA guidelines. Uh, they recommend that the patients be selected where palliation is the intent of treatment. That's a carryover from our government uh, requiring that uh, patients whose cancer is curable not receive ESAs uh, or the drugs will not be paid for. And so that goes into a guideline. There's, there's, there's uh, uh, not a good literature for that but approach, but that's a carryover. Uh, and they want to rule out other kinds of anemias. They consider all of the ESAs equivalent and don't speak of them differently. The initiation hemoglobin must be lower than 10. Uh, with 10 to 12 initiation points being acceptable in these guidelines based upon clinical judgment. Uh, the target hemoglobin is the lowest that prevents transfusions. And so we're talking about running patients at a very low hemoglobin level with ESAs, not one that you would expect to be associated with improvement of quality of life. Uh, so we have seeded the whole quality of life uh, uh, potential benefit uh, with, with the current approach to guidelines. Uh, the reduce the dose if the patient is responding too well, if the response rate is greater than a gram per deciliter over two weeks. Stop if they do not respond uh, and uh, monitor iron, but they felt there was insufficient evidence to recommend iron. A very conservative set of guidelines. Um, this is the uh, doses that, that of the different agents available in the U.S. that that they uh, 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 that they reference. Uh, the uh, options in terms of frequency of dosing and which doses are used. You're all very used to this. Now, switching over to the NCCN. The NCCN is a much more clinically useful set of guidelines, and they have tried in writing these to be as helpful to clinicians as possible without stepping in some of the political uh, uh, puddles that litter the ESA landscape in the United States. So they also talk about it being palliative intent, meaning patients where cure is a possibility cannot be treated. Uh, nutritional anemias and hemolysis are ruled out. They consider the agents equivalent. If you read carefully, they are not clear about what in the initiation hemoglobin uh, that they are recommending is. No one, no one uh, uh, can say what, what a, the initiating hemoglobin ought to be across a large number of patients. Many of us believe it should be individualized. Uh, that is, that it should start when symptoms start or when it looks like the hemoglobin is falling very quickly. Uh, and um, they imply that the indications for starting these drugs are the same as the indications for starting red cell transfusions. So that would mean uh, starting very late when people had symptoms uh, or, uh, uh, or were profoundly anemic and, and facing transfusion. The target dose is the lowest that prevents transfusions. They request a reduction in dose if the patient has a rapid response, stop if the patient doesn't respond, and for iron, they clearly lay out the data and are much more supportive of it than the ASH-ASCO guidelines. So um, 
they, they here's their, uh, their their risk list of risks and benefits of the uh, of the ESAs. This possible decrease in cancer survival remains in 2014 in the NCCN guidelines. Uh, I'll show you that it is even more. Uh, uh, dramatized uh, for our cancer patients in forms that they're required to sign. Uh, and they talk about the risks of, of red cell transfusions as well. And it's clear that the risk benefit here doesn't involve quality of life or re relief of fatigue. It involves balancing the risk of transfusions against the risk of ESAs, two, two negative things being weighed against each other. Um, they, they talk about special categories of patients. In the United States, uh, it is much easier to get ESAs for patients who have renal insufficiency. So one of the common strategies on the part of oncologists who want to treat patients is to, is to uh, check their kidney function. And if their kidney function warrants ESA therapy independent of the cancer, they pursue that route where, uh, uh, where goals to maintain functionality are, are still part of how patients are treated. Uh, if uh, patients have curative intent, ESAs are not recommended. Uh, patients undergoing palliative treatment, uh, they talk about the, uh, the considerations uh, of the ESAs on dosing, et cetera, uh, follow the, and recommend following the package insert. So they, they do a very good job of, uh, at least in the 2014 version, of bringing this whole new iron uh, story to the table and talking about uh, considering adding uh, parenteral iron to any ESA uh, preparation uh, if the transfer and saturation is 50% or less. Um, uh, here's the, the schedules and doses that we don't need to spend much time on. This is uh, something that I just want to show you that in the, in the United States, if a oncologist wishes to be able, be allowed to prescribe ESAs, he must go online, he or she must go online and take a course that talks about all of the negative survival impacts that ESAs have. And he has to re-up that course on a regular basis and keep his, his number active. When he treats a patient, the patient has to be given a consent form, uh, and that consent form says, I understand that this may make my cancer grow and reduce my survival. And so no one in the United States receives an ESA without signing that form. And then the doctor has to sign and attest I told the patient this was going to decrease their survival. Here's my number. I'm up to date. I gave them all the forms. So if you're looking for why ESA use has fallen off so dramatically in the United States, it's not because of a guideline. It has in part to do with reimbursement policies. Uh, for instance, it doesn't matter that the guideline says if somebody has angina when their hemoglobin is 10 and a half, that would be a good time to start ESAs. If you do that, you will not be reimbursed. The, the, the drug will not be covered by the government. It, the, the hemoglobin has to be under 10 uh, unless the patient has renal failure. <clears throat> So now this is, this is the most important uh, thing, this, this, uh, this uh, risk mitigation program called a prize has been the, uh, the tipping point. Now there's another kind of, a uh, much easier kind of hematologic toxicity, uh, a happier kind of hematologic toxicity to talk about, and that's myelotoxicity. There are guidelines out there. there this, this is the ash asco guidelines. They are very old. They're 14 years old. Um, at that time, they thought that the, growth, that the growth factor should be used only if the risk is 40% of febrile neutropenia. <coughs> Uh, that it wasn't justified to treat a febrile neutropenia. The patient comes in, they've had chemo, their neutrophil count is 200 and, uh, per, per microliter, and 
the doctor uh, wants to give growth factor at that point, that's not justified. There have been three randomized trials that have shown no benefit. Secondary prophylaxis is, is, is for patients who've had a febrile neutropenic event on a prior cycle. Uh, if a patient is admitted to the hospital with febrile neutropenia, if they're already on CSFs, they're continued. They're otherwise not routinely justified based on the randomized Australian trial. Uh, and that they, at the time these were written, these things were emerging as treatments that were safe in induction of AML. And no one has distinguished GCSF from GMCSF from pegfilgrastum in any guidelines. That's not very useful and it's very dated. The NCCN guidelines are updated. This is the 2014 version. For primary prophylaxis, they call for 20% risk or higher. Uh, and uh, and that, that can come from the risk of the regimen itself or the risk of the patient. So the same chemotherapy regimen in a healthy 22-year-old may have a much lower risk than that identical chemotherapy regimen in a 75-year-old with an open wound uh, or in a patient with HIV infection. So uh, they, they take into account that, that that risk doesn't have to come from the regimen itself. Uh, secondary prophylaxis uh, is only uh, prudent when a simple dose reduction in the chemotherapy would not uh, be, be a smarter uh, approach. A febrile neutropenia is still not routine. Febrile neutropenia only if there are se severe risk factors. Uh, it looks like if you wait till a patient is sick and in the hospital, neutropenic and infected, and start growth factor, you do shorten the duration of neutropenia by a day or so. And for most patients, that won't change their antibiotics, the length of their hospitalization, or their outcome. But for critically ill patients who are uh, on the brink of going to the intensive care unit, it might. And so they, uh, they, they allow for very sick patients who have febrile neutropenia to receive, GCSF, to receive a CSF. They talk about peripheral blood progenitor cell harvesting, uh, AML, and don't distinguish the agents uh, uh, except for doses and toxicities. So here's their guidelines uh, summarized by them. Uh, if it's over 20%, treat. If it's 10 to 20%, consider it and consider patient factors. And if it's low, no primary prophylaxis. Uh, for secondary uh, prophylaxis, uh, it's either lower the chemotherapy dose or, uh, or, give, the, or give the growth factor. Um, uh, if a patient develops febrile neutropenia and they're on CSFs, they stay on CSFs for the rest of that hospitalization and the chemotherapy dose is reduced. If they hadn't received prior CSFs, they finish the hospitalization and then receive it on subsequent cycles. Okay, so here's the presentation of patients with febrile neutropenia. Uh, very useful data, all available to everybody online. Very useful way of of summarizing the available data. They even have lists of chemotherapy regimens that are high risk here, the, those that were, the reported rate is always over 20%. And here are the intermediates where the reported rate is typically between 10 and 20% of febrile neutropenia. So the GCSF is, uh, and myeloid story are much better worked out, and the, uh, uh, the ESA story in the United States remains a, one of, of regulation and, uh, and underuse. Mm. Alors, y a des questions dans la salle? Questions? Any questions? for erythropoietin and anemia to begin with. There seemed from the barometer study that about 40% of the patients were apparently on an ESA. So I gather that in France, the enthusiasm is relatively high. Do we have figures for utilization of uh, the EPO-like products 
across Europe, for example, Italy or Germany versus France? I, I really don't know. Florent, you say? Florent, if you have different publications on the Tell us something about the use uh, of uh, erythropoietins in the different European countries. Because the question was, have you compared the use of uh, these uh, EPO-like products in European countries? Unfortunately, Flora is not speaking in the mic. Well, the Lud Ludwig has published on East, uh, seven Europe East European countries, and Maro Matja published something on um, nine uh, Euro East European countries. Is he there? Yeah, but the question was on diagnosis of anemia and of um, iron deficiency, which is not quite the same. There you are, Matty. Well, there is some data available on use, which were presented at some meetings. So there seems to be a reduction in the use of uh, ESAs but not like in the US for two reasons. Firstly, in the US, uh, there was an overuse uh, which was uh, inevitable. And then, as John Glasby explained to us today, the present use of uh, ESA has become so complicated that a lot of people have just given up, uh, even if they feel that it is usable. Now, in France, a few years ago, there was this passion for um, erythropoietin about 15 years ago, and a lot of women who had a juven uh, treatment for breast cancer were given it, but now it's all over. Yeah, there are data coming from firms, and they show there's a fall of 35 to 40 percent in the use of ESA in these last 10 years or so. I have a question, given the side effects, the thromboembolytic uh, effects of EPO. Should we continue the EPO treatment for anemia when you have just metastatic cancer and not use it for other cancers which are not metastatic? Thank you. Which was a country with heavy use of EPOS? When the first alarm came, or the Henke paper in Head and Neck came, the radiotherapists, who were the first users, the ones who basically radiotherapists were the first to use anesthesia in oncology, basically, except I think my radiotherapist in my hospital, zero. They stopped. And then uh, all my colleagues with breast cancer with adjuvant, most of them with adjuvant, they don't give it unless that person is really sick, hemoglobin is nine, etc. It has been a drop basically in 30, 35 percent. Interestingly enough, from four or five years ago, over the last, I would say, two years, there's a little, little increase. So we didn't go further down. We increased maybe five, not 10 percent, less than 10 percent, compared to the big drop four or five years ago. And uh, interestingly, which I never thought, the entrance, we now have biosimilars. I thought biosimilars, see, the originals have a cloud, biosimilars will have two clouds, right? Uh, has been accepted, uh, not as as fast as GCSF biosimilars, but but point is now some centers that were an issue of economics more than theoretically or problems uh, have been now incorporated uh, uh, into their pharmacies. But still, we are, we are maybe 35 percent drop compared to four or five years ago, but no further drop. So, so um, that's a, an excellent question, and you picked the correct toxicity, right? Um, this impact on cancer biology, uh, I, I think, is a tenuous one and is something that, with time, is, is diminishing. But we clearly learned that ESAs increase the risk of thromboembolism, and that's their major documented toxicity. And the relative risk is somewhere around 1.5. So if the baseline risk in a patient is 7%, is then it goes up to 
or 10.5% type, type thing. That belongs in the risk benefit uh, equation. But we, there are similar thromboembolic data for tamoxifen. And we don't have meetings where we chew our nails and talk about how horrible it is that we've unleashed tamoxifen on the human population, or Revlimid uh, on myeloma patients. The question is, do the risks, are the risks warranted by the benefits? And I think there are situations where they can be. What I fear is, is with this pendulum swinging, we've lost a generation of doctors. One really neat observation got made in the 1990s when the dialysis patients of the world were all receiving EPO max to maximize their functional status. And the cancer patients were being told, too bad, if you feel bad, there's nothing we can do for you because you have cancer, there's no way you could feel a change in your anemia. And although the U.S. government doesn't want to admit it, I think it's fairly clear that cancer patients are human beings and they can feel the same thing other human beings feel and they feel it sometimes when they're anemic. And depending how bad they feel it and how big a risk of transfusions they face, transfusions also being very thrombogenic. Right? So as you balance those risks, I think you could find patients. It should never have been the runaway orgy that it was in the U.S. The U.S. brought this on themselves because of the way economics work. Any patient who could show they were getting chemo and had a hemoglobin less than 12 was getting treated because that was where all the incentives were for the providers. And that was true even if they felt fine and were riding their bike 20 miles a day and that was their last dose of chemotherapy so there was no way they were going to face a transfusion. That patient never should have been treated. Now in the United States we have patients who should be treated who aren't. And that's the shame and we've raised up a whole generation of doctors who believe it's an established fact that ESAs uh, kill cancer patients. And when the smoke clears and the cheaper drugs come and the economic incentive goes away and there's a time to find an equipoise that's best for the patients because they are human beings and can feel this, I, there won't be doctors who are interested in pursuing it. All this will be lost with the generation of doctors that generated that initial data because the trainees don't believe that anymore. Uh, uh, John, you, you brought a couple of very important things. <coughs> oh, you want to talk? <laughs> I was, I was going to ask the question of the thrombogenic effects of transfusions. You have a huge increase in the hematocrit with the hyperviscosity, but we never talk about that. It's assumed that. But then you mentioned something very interesting, which is the issue of... Uh, of um, of that people are using, etc. They are uh, uh, the new generation. Lost the, the loss of new generation of young doctors. They are not going to give apples. Um, unfortunately, oncologists uh, every day more become to be hyper hyper specialized. And no matter how many papers appear in the supportive section of JCO, <laughs> right? If you have breast cancer, you only read breast cancer. You drop you drop the, the issue to the garbage. You have lung cancer, you only read lung cancer. No matter how important is a paper inside of JCO, you will not look at that. But today we're talking to Matty Apro. I mean, he has a paper on uh, a Brave where there's no, no negative signal. Have you heard about that? No. Then we have, I think, three on adjuvant chemotherapy in breast cancer. I think three papers. And neither one has any negative signal, an equal, no increased mortality, nothing. Then we have two lymphomas paper where also those are, uh, patients intend to, intend to cure that not only one is negative, is neutral, but the other has a positive effect on erythropoietins, increased free uh, progressive free survival. But again, uh, you can talk as many times as you want that if people don't look at the, they're, they're just pursuing their own 
primary tumor specialization, um, nothing reaches to the people. But it's unfortunately, because as, as John has mentioned, a new generation of physicians are coming trained by their own senior people, like erythropoietins are killing people. Uh, this is uh, very unfortunate because many people they don't benefit of, of, of the area, uh, really in a frame that ISIS has a role. Autre question. I have a question for both of you. In your own prat practical exercise, practice, how do you do? Use a pill, erythropoietin, when? 11 grams, 11.9, and you stop at 10, 12. That's, uh, it's very difficult to, to initiate erythropoietin. It's so uh, difficult also to stop because um, delay is very short. So, so I, you know, I, I use relatively little ESA oh, yeah. in, in my practice. I use less than I would if I were free to use it the way I think is best for the patients. And I always used less than, than other people in the U.S. did when this was a runaway sort of train. Um, the real problem in the U.S. is that a prize program and uh, uh, having patients forced to sign a letter, a paper that says this will decrease my survival. Um, they, they, that's not something that I even want to put somebody through. To have to, even to have to sit with them and say, you know, th these are what the data are based on. You can make your own decision. That it's it brings so much trauma to them to have that to have that said. It's it's an affront from their government, who's the one that's saving money. You know. Um, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, I've learned in this. Remember that old saying that. There's not a dividing line between good men and evil men. There's a dividing line between the middle of every man's heart, and there's good on one side and evil on the other. Mm. And I think that that uh, regulators are conflicted as well. And there are times when they aren't thinking with the right side of their heart sometimes when they do things. Um, we had a patient the other day who had uh, stage 3C ovarian cancer and has had three transfusions and uh, she's only two-thirds through her chemotherapy mm -hmm. and she can't be treated because cure is the intent. If she had stage 4 ovarian cancer, she would have been on the drug a long time ago. It, it, you get these kind of ridiculous things happening because of the rules and you cannot treat someone where cure is your intention. So lymphoma can't be treated, uh, first line of several agents, adjuvant breast, all those things are off the table. We can't treat them no matter how compelling the... the, the, the it it should be very frustrating for you, <laughs> right? I, am, on my side, I used to give talks on early intervention. I recall like six, seven years ago, I have a beautiful uh, drawings, slides, wonderful, a lot of papers on L intervention. The title of the paper is L intervention. I can bring you five or six papers. And it's proven beyond, I mean, any, 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 any measure that um, you, uh, the response is much faster. You allow a patient to go below 10, nine and a half. Is, uh, the biology of the cancer probably changes. It, must, it takes much longer to reach the 12, much longer uh, at the time where, uh, it was very expensive. This may, meant a lot of money invested. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then the response is much uh, much faster. So you reach 12 s sooner than you wait at below 10, and at that time you were saving a lot of money. There's a one on site. What I do normally, um, I'm from the old guard, so to speak, right? So I'm very confident with the point is, so I don't, nobody has to convince me, uh, but obviously you try to be rigorous and s as scientific as possible. I just try to run 10, 10 and a half. I don't want to put the persons below 10 to the risk of, of having to to, to get the transfusion, and I don't see the difference from 10 and a half and 10. I recall 10 probably in the United States, correct me if I'm wrong, Medicare only pays, right, uh, f uh, 
cancer is in general a, 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 a disease of the elderly, right? So the government pays more, it pays the government below, uh, so above, above 65 years of age, right? So if you, I put the, the threshold 10 and a half or 10, the federal government can save millions of, of dollars by saving erythropoietin, just by bringing to 10 grams of hemoglobin. Do you know what I'm trying to tell you? Yeah, perhaps this is a little bit complicated with the yeah. safety data. So we, we, several of us in this room showed in a paper in 2009 that if you really are worried about thromboembolism in these patients, uh, you're going to see an increase in thromboembolism if you transfuse them, and you're going to see an increase in thromboembolism if you give them ESAs, and you're really going to see an increase in thromboembolism if you do both to the same patient. And the patients who did the very worst, the ones where safety really was shocking bad, were the patients who got both ESAs and transfused. And as you lower your initiation point, assuming people are going to stay on chemotherapy, as you lower it even to 10, you start to see an increase. There have been three papers that looked at starting at 10 versus 11, and the difference was more people needed a transfusion before the ESAs could start working in the 10 group. And now, in the United States, we can't ever give a dose if they're over 10, so we're starting under 10, hopefully in the nines, um, and a lot of those people are going on to get a transfusion and ESAs, and from a public health standpoint, we may have made uh, a tricky situation much worse because we may now have a lot more of these bad behaving patients that are getting both ESAs and transfu transfused. We, we, were, we were hoping for an, an era when nobody would get transfused because we start them early enough to stop it. I would say that uh, to finish my, well, how I treat patients, right? Ten and a half will be my threshold. But if a person is symptomatic, all guidelines, and, and John has put it, uh, clinical criteria, even below 12, even I see ASCO, if a person is symptomatic, and the classical scenario will be a head and neck patient who maybe normally has a hemoglobin 16, 17, and brings to 11.9, is really, really symptomatic. So this will be my thing, uh, okay, symptomatic anemia, and then I use a threshold. I don't, for the reasons that John has said, I don't like to treat a patient below 10, because then I put the patient to a risk, okay, and it takes much longer to reach to 12. Uh, John, you, you alluded to, to the problem of uh, patients who have transfusions and APO. Uh, I think that's, that's a major problem. But you have a spectrum of patients. If you look at some studies where you can get the details, like the lymphoma study, you'll find out that the economy of transfusion between APO and non-APO patients is less than two. It's one point something. So that a large number of patients who get APO get also transfused. And then in that group of patients, you have those who get more than just one or two transfusions, and they are really doing poorly regarding thrombophilia. And then you have, on the other hand, those who don't get very much. They probably don't need the APO. So it's very difficult to sort out the risks, the relative risks. And when you say the relative risk of uh, thromboembolic disease is 1.5, which is correct, that is on the total yes. group of patients. So it's, <laughs> you end up again trying to, let's forget the personalized story, but trying to sort out subgroups of patients, and it's very difficult. But I'm worried about the public health impact of what we've done in the United States. It may not have been that we just took most of the SAs away from the patients, and that has some downsides for the patients. But we may have stacked, uh, we may have loaded that ESA that we're still willing to give the patients into those patients who are also going to be heavily transfused. <laughs> and net net, we may actually, um, the ESAs plus the FDA may be more dangerous than just the ESAs alone. <laughs> and now that's on tape somewhere, so <laughs> now I can't go home. <laughs> Il nous reste deux minutes pour parler des. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left 
to talk about uh, uh, growth factors. On a utilisé donc les. Well, we used growth factors. We've used growth factors uh, on, on a uh, daily basis for the last 20 years. And we don't know if the best is to have eight days, 14 days, depending on the chemotherapy protocols and depending on the patient. So there's still a, an, an open debate about how many days uh, uh, sh sh should we uh, administer. Uh, and it would seem that um, there would be more of a consensus in favor of uh, pedulated um, Uh, growth factors because it's only one injection, so it's easier for patients that have injections all the time. The, pr the problem with those uh, PEG growth factors is the six milligram dose, and there's uh, very uh, little in the literature in terms of lower doses, four milligrams, very small series. So what do you think about lower doses? choice of the dose for the pegylated GCSF products was an agonizing one for the manufacturer because mm -hmm. uh, they recognized, because they had experience with their previous iteration of GCSF, that once you set a price and release it, somebody might give less and what you thought your cycle of treatment was worth is suddenly not, not being paid what you think it should be paid. And so they put a little more thought and work into this. And the six milligram dose was the lowest dose at which they saw their, their consistently best suppression of febrile neutropenia. Um, the, I just, <laughs> for Japan last week launched pegylated GCSF. I, a, a 14 year old drug was just launched in Japan. And they launched it at a dose of 3.6 milligrams. And so the world hasn't agreed on the question you're asking. Um, the harder question comes when you treat a patient and they get really bad bone pain, should you reduce the dose? And that is where the dose reductions usually happen these days. And the data say that it doesn't appear in cutting the dose to lower the bone pain rates. but but that's a toxic, not a therapeutic outcome. And for the therapeutics, there's a benefit at much lower doses. They just wanted to get the one where they got the most. And above six, nothing additional happened. So a lot of people do cut the dose, especially in people who've had bone pain on a prior cycle, empirically without evidence that it's the right thing to do. And there are whole countries that took longer to think about this and came up with a whole different dose. Okay. Donc je crois qu'on va clôturer cette I think we're going to close the session and move on to the next session.